Hey, hey, hey. Time for another out of this world story from our space. Revenge is a dish best served soiled. This is the story about how I found out my girlfriend of over three years was cheating on me and how I went about getting my revenge. This happened over a year ago, so it's been good to get it all down, been thinking about it for a while. Certainly feels cathartic, and I tried to make it as entertaining as possible. Thanks in advance for reading. I suppose firstly, I should start by telling you how I met my girlfriend, and what she came to mean to me. I first met Sarah at a yoga class in the summer of 2016. Never in my life did I think I would see myself going to something like that. The silly spandex, the holier-than-thou attitude, the way everyone talked to each other like they were freaking high. It's not something I ever imagined myself doing, but when I hurt my back after falling from the first floor at work, I decided to give it a shot on the recommendation of my back masseuse and found a hall in my city doing beginner yoga classes. When the day to go came and I walked through the door, I instantly stuck out like a sore thumb. Everyone was standing around talking, dressed to the nines and their best yoga gear, while I sauntered in wearing bog standard shorts and t-shirt looking like someone from a cowboy flick walking onto a sci-fi movie set. I immediately wanted to about turn and leave, of course. But the woman doing the class seemed the look of pure terror in my eyes and came up to me and said hello. I told her why I was there and that I didn't feel very comfortable, but she insisted that I should give it a try, as she thought it would help my back problems, and if not, well, no harm, no foul. I felt better at that point and thought, F it, might as well try and get my money's worth even if I do end up looking like a diseased pretzel. It was then that I looked across the room and seen the same look of terror that I had no doubt in portraying. That was Sarah. She had not long found out she had scoliosis after years of being misdiagnosed and told that it was all in her head among other things. She was there with her mother, who was with her for emotional support and to see how she got on. After seeing her, I instinctively gravitated towards her in the same way that a drowning person gravitates toward a life ring thrown at them. After the yoga instructor had a chat with her, she shouted me over and said that it was Sarah's first time too. So maybe we should sit next to one another and give each other a bit of support. I said that was cool with me, and she also smiled and nodded, so I walked over. We hit it off right away. My emotions went from a bit of embarrassment to serious amusement as we both attempted to fit in with the rest of the class. After the class was over, we were still talking away and I felt a genuine connection and butterflies in my stomach. And as we said goodbye, we caught each other's gaze and she smiled at me with a purity that for the first time in my life made me feel weak in the knees. I wouldn't have went back in a million years had I not met her, but I decided to go the next week, and when I walked to the door, I got those butterflies in my stomach again and was hoping to see her face, but she wasn't there. As I was sitting there, I felt this feeling of pure dread and was sat thinking, what the F am I even doing here? I felt this sadness that was hard to describe. It kind of reminded me when I went to this holiday caravan park when I was about 12 with my gran and cousins, and there was this big center with pool tables and amusements and all that stuff. I remember seeing this girl there every night for a week, and I instantly fell in love with her. I didn't say a freaking word to her right enough, but psyched myself up so that I was going to try to speak to her on the last night at the disco. But when we went down, she wasn't there. I'll never forget that feeling of sadness as we went home. That girl had walked out of my life, as she probably didn't even know she walked into it. I felt the same aching sadness when I didn't see Sarah. I knew nothing about her, had no way of contacting her, and felt this surreal sadness that was hard to quantify. About four months later, I was working on a roof, repairing a truss damaged in a storm, and we decided to stop for a break. As we made our way back to the van, the house owner came out and asked us for one cups of coffee. We accepted, and she came out with coffee and biscuits. As soon as I seen this woman, I just knew her face somewhere, but couldn't for the life of me place her. It wasn't until that night after racking my brains that I realized it was at that yoga hole I had seen her before. It was Sarah's mother. The next day, I was back finishing the job and the same thing happened. We stopped for a break, went down towards the van, and the woman came out asking if we wanted some coffee. After we finished up, I took the cups and biscuit wrappers back and as I was passing them over to her, I asked how her daughter was and was she still having back problems. She looked surprised but smiled at me and said, yes, then asked how I knew her. I replied that I'd spoke to her at a yoga class months back. She laughed and she said she remembered me now. I then gave her a card with my number written on it and asked if she could maybe get her daughter to text me as I wanted to get back in touch with her. Shoot my shot, I thought. I wish I freaking hadn't now. 
I got a text message that night from Sarah, asking how I was, and that she had looked for me again at the yoga hall, but I wasn't there. Turned out, she had went back the week after me, as she thought it was bi-weekly. We met up soon after, really hit it off again, and after eight months, she moved in with me. She was funny, smart, and sweet, as well as being the most uniquely beautiful person I'd ever met. She had a whimsical beauty to her, pointed ears and defined features. She reminded me of a she-elf for something. I truly thought I'd found my soulmate. She had moved into my home, and everything was going great guns. She was on disability, and got personal independence payments, and was getting steroid injections for her scoliosis, which along with painkillers and exercises, were keeping her pain at bay. We would alternate the cooking, while she done the cooking, and took care of our cat, Mitzi. I was also making good money, so we were in a comfortable position financially. When I'd get back from work, we'd always be doing things like going out on walks or the like, just always in each other's company. It was at this point I was seriously contemplating proposing to her. Things changed around Halloween 2019. Our sex life was always very active, but there were times when she occasionally wasn't up to it, and I was fine with that. We work around positions that were comfortable for her due to her back problems, but I'd say in general, she had a high sex drive. Well, around October, she started complaining a lot about her back hurting more, especially just before the times we'd usually go to bed together. Anytime we did have sex after that, it wasn't passionate or intense. It felt like we were going through the motions. She started complaining while we were in the middle of it, so at that point, I'd stop, of course. I started feeling really sexually frustrated, but I was positive that it was just a bled, and that we'd get through it together. The thing is, she seemed fine in other aspects of her life. She seemed happy. The first real red flag for me came in December when she completely stopped showing me affection. She just became cold towards me and seemed repulsed when I put my arms around her or tried to take her hand. She was the one who was so touchy-feely, hands in the air, constant reaffirming touches, kisses and cuddles. When we'd sit on the couch, she'd basically be on top of me. That all completely stopped. Didn't for Mitzi, though. Yes, that's right. I ended up jealous of our cat. At this point, we were in the new year, and I suspected her of cheating. She'd become downright hostile towards me. I started trying to up my workload around the house, but nothing was good enough. I ended up constantly being belittled and walking on eggshells. Couldn't do right for wrong, and was starting to become a humorless shallow of my witty former self. One night, I got a hold of her phone and looked through it. Nothing. Was clean as a whistle. Wasn't even any messages from her friends or her mother, which I found weird. It was then that my friend told me that if we were on the same plan, then I could check on the carer's website and see all the activity from her phone. We were on the same plan, and I paid for her phone. That night, I logged into my BT account, navigated to mobile, then her number. Started to sift through, and there it was. Thousands of texts and calls to this one specific number. It had started six months previous, and it had dates, times, and how long the calls were. She'd be speaking to and texting this person for hours and hours while I was at work, deleting everything before I got home. Then going cold turkey when I got back. I googled the number, and it came up a local garage, one where she had got her car fixed previously. I remembered it taking a while for it to get fixed, and her complaining about it a lot. The whole thing was a long drawn out affair, and more ways than one apparently. At this point, I was ice cold. I already had it got into my head, she was having an affair. So getting it confirmed was more a relief than anything else. I wanted to catch her in the act, rather than have her attempt to gaslight me and swarm out of the circumstantial. So I found out everything I could about this guy. I found out where he lived, that he had a young wife and child, found out what car he drove, Eva walked in asking about prices, so I could look this guy in the eye and get a measure of him. His name was Carl, with a K. I knew this affair was physical for lots of reasons, but the fact that their phone calls and texts stopped dead from one to two each day said to me that this was the time they were meeting up. I came with all sorts of silly plans, to loan my friend's car and sit at the end of the street, then wait till she drove out, then follow her to the place she was meeting this guy and jump out the car while they were in the act, like, surprise, I'm ever... There were too many variables in that though, and I'm no private detective. One day, I decided to drive by his garage about half one, and her car was just sitting there, and the place was locked up. So mystery solved. I was at this point at the end of my tether, and ready to just tell her that I knew everything and get the F out of my house, when she asked if it would be okay to go away to a spa place for the weekend, alone. She said she was depressed with everything, with her back being so much worse, that this place would be great to help her with that, with all the things she could do, 
that she could come back refreshed and like a new person. She was right about that, because I didn't know who the F this was standing in front of me anymore. Obviously, she wasn't going there alone, if she was even going there at all. This would be a dirty weekend away with this guy. I said fine, now I had a new plan, and this would be the last effing thing I'd do for her. If you're thinking this is all too much for a kerfuffle, then you're right, obviously, but my position is I wanted revenge, and I wanted to get her back with some style. I didn't just want her to cry at and gaslight me for days, then leave me on her terms, with me the bad guy. I would be the bad guy, but it would be my terms she'd be leaving on all right. The Friday came, and the spa was a hundred or so miles down the road, so she decided to get a train. I jokingly asked her if she couldn't find something more local. Umming and owing followed till I told her I was only kidding. I got off work a couple of hours early and took her into the train station. Despite her protests, she would get a taxi, as I wanted to see her off. We drive then, and as I'm looking for a place to park, you wouldn't guess whose car I spot. That's right, Carl with a K. I think, F it, I'm gonna have some fun and make her squirm, so I park up directly next to him. They're right next to each other, door to door, as she immediately becomes uneasy, not knowing where to look. I'm pretending to look for something trying to draw out the moment, and the atmosphere is razor sharp at that point. What happened next genuinely caused me to do something out with my plan. She started to silently giggle. You know when you go to church or someone dies, and you go to church because someone dies and something funny pops into your head? And it becomes mental torture desperately trying to think of something else and stop yourself from laughing maniacally? Well, she's desperately trying not to laugh. I'm pretending not to notice. She's tapping her hand on her trouser leg, and from the corner of my eye, I can see him, with his head on the effing steering wheel. She actually lets out a laugh, then quickly disguises it as a cough, and starts clearing her throat. I start doing the whole tapping of back thing, and I'm just thinking to myself, I can't wait to get you back. So we all go through life, being the butt of the joke, at least once. Whether it be passive-aggressive work colleagues, or when you get up and try and do a talk at school with a face redder than the devil himself. But you never expect that crap from people who are supposed to have your back, even if you are conspiring against them at that point. I helped her into the train station with her things, made sure she had her bearings, said goodbye and walked away. By the time I got out, car with a case car was nowhere to be seen, so I went back home, composed myself and carried out my plan. My plan was simple but effective. I started by having a locksmith come out to change the locks. I then proceeded to pack all of her clothes and belongings into bin bags and put it round the side of the house. On Friday night, with the noise of her laughing at me ringing in my ears, I'd done something I never imagined I could do. I took Mitzi's litter tray, walked around the side of the house with it, opened the bin bag with Sarah's belongings in it, and threw it in. Gave the bag a good shake, then tied it up again. The way I seen it at the time was that it's cause and effect in action. She caused me to effectively put cat crap in with her things. If you're thinking I'm an a-hole, then you're probably right. I'll never win any awards for being nicest neighbor on the block. If I don't like you within five minutes of meeting you, I probably never will. And the only time I'd ever take out your trash is if you are the trash. If you do break through those barriers, though, I think I'm a loyal, caring person. I didn't do anything to deserve being cheated on. Except maybe putting cat litter in with her things, but that was after the fact. I spent the Saturday in a mire of depression, answering her texts with the only energy I could muster which wasn't a lot. I complained of a severe headache from a hangover I had never had, and the text dwindled. The reality of what was transpiring hit home, and for the first time since before New Year, I took stock of my life, sitting in my swivel chair with Mitzi in tow, like a freaking Bond villain. Sunday came, and I was ready to execute the final part of my plan. Firstly, I drove to Carl with a K's house, and put a letter through his door. It was addressed to his wife, and basically said in block capitals, important, Carl the K's wife name open immediately. Inside it was a letter outlining how her husband was having an affair with my girlfriend, copies of her phone calls and text log, as well as other information like that they were away together this weekend. I put it through the door, rang the doorbell and walked away, got in my car and drove for a minute, then parked up again. Then I phoned Sarah. I genuinely can't remember a lot of what I said to her, but it was something along the lines of me asking how everything was going. She started to gush about how much she enjoyed herself, that she feels like a new woman and that she could maybe see herself doing it two or three times a year, you know, to blow off the cobwebs, certainly to blow something. At this point I blurt out, How's Carl? Her yapping stops dead. Silence fills the air until she finally says, Who's Carl? You know, I reply, Carl, with a K. 
I then proceeded to tell her that I knew everything, that I chained the locks and all her stuff was round the side of my house. Instead of being apologetic, she goes on a thunderous diatribe, blaming me for everything, basically stabbing me in the back, all complaining that my backbone was blunting her blade. At the end, I told her how her stuff smelled of Mitzi's poo and hung up. I blocked her number and didn't see hide nor hair of her until the Wednesday. When I came back from work, she was sitting on the doorstep. All the bags had been moved. I ignored her, walked round the back, let myself in the back door, and locked it behind me. Haven't spoken to her since, although she's made her attempts, including a letter. In regards to Carl, I don't know what happened between him and his wife. I do know that he said it wasn't personal to a friend of mine. That made me angry, like his ass was to make it better. Someone saying something isn't personal just means it isn't personal to them. It was to me. If someone smashes through your front room in a 4x4 obliterating everyone you've ever loved, is it easier to get over it if they didn't personally mean it? Is it easier to pick up the pieces and put them back together again? No. I heard that COVID hasn't been kind to his business though, but you won't catch me shedding no tears for that, unless it's tears of laughter that is. I one only comment comes from Chepo1966. It is good to see that there are still men with values and principles that even if one is in love, there are such important things to be begging, to be chosen, denigrating and crying nowadays is almost the norm to see. So much man without dignity, without self-love and without dignity that when you see one who acts in a normal way or how to act, one feels totally admired. Deception or betrayal should always be the end of a relationship, even when it lasts or it is more than once. The pain caused by this act can never be overcome while you are with the one who caused the door. It is better to do what you have done. I really love you. You are a man of great self-esteem and dignity. Luck and be sure that you will return, or rather, you will find a great woman.